God Almighty. Please meet us in this place this morning with a special measure of grace, with a special measure of your Holy Spirit opening our hearts, opening our minds, and ministering to us not from Pastor David's words, but from the word of God. Lord, we're opening up your word because we want to hear from you. So Lord, meet us in this place of study in the exposition of your word. In the mighty name of the King of Kings, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you to my wife and thank you to all the church body here for allowing me to go spend last weekend at, at Calvary Chapel Stone Mountain uh, with Pastor Sandy Adams. We had an awesome weekend. It was a very refreshing weekend, nice relaxing weekend. We spent the weekend uh, uh, st- reading the scriptures, in prayer, singing songs, worshiping. And it was just great rubbing shoulders with other Calvary Chapel pastors. And I can truly say with all my heart, I feel refreshed. I feel refreshed and I'm ready to go again. I'm ready to go again and my battery's recharged and I'm ready to go out at it ministry. Amen? Amen? The title of my message this morning, turning your Bibles to James chapter 4. We're going through the whole entire chapter this morning. The title of my message is, The War Within and a Grace That is Greater. Now, I need to say this up front, because in the South, we like to go, to, we go to church on a regular basis, but I need you this morning to open your hearts. Open, uh, this is a special exhortation to open your hearts, to be honest, and to be raw this morning, because it, it really impacted my life and my heart this week as I studied this passage. But I want you to be honest, I want you to be raw, and I want your hearts to be open, because this is a, a, a subject that's very applicable for today. And it is very applicable to every single believer's life. There is a war within the Christian's heart when it comes to this area of our flesh and sin. But I got good news. There's a grace that is greater to deal with that sinful heart. And God in this passage, and you can lay it out like this. Verses 1 through 4 of this passage, we're going to talk about the war within. And then, then verses 5 through 17, we're going to talk about the, the grace that is greater. But there is a war within every believer, every believer's heart, a war between the spirit and the flesh. How many of you ever seen, ever known, heard of a well-known minister to fall from grace or someone that was real popular um, to be serving the Lord? to be on fire, and then they fall. And it breaks your heart. It it hurts our hearts to see a minister fall. I was reading this week about a well-known minister and his battle within. This minister was greatly admired. He was a righteous man, a caring man. He served the Lord faithfully for many years. He was an intercessor. He was a man of integrity and honesty. He loved the word of God. He was a worshiper. He was the one that stood up in front of others and preached. Even his enemies acknowledged his zeal for the Lord. He was a very godly man. But one day, his world came crashing down. In a moment of weakness, this minister slept with another man's wife, and she became pregnant. And then in his panic, he made arrangements for the hitman, he made arrangements for a hitman to kill her husband. This is a true story. This really did happen. His world began to crumble. He described the vivid details of his horror, of the horrible war that was within his soul. He was stricken with a disease. His friends abandoned him. His sons turned on him. His soul was flooded with grief and bitter tears. He could not sleep at night. He admitted the guilt was unbearable. 
He came under the chastening of the rod of God. He said, he said in, in, in his writings, he said, my burden is intolerable. My sin has caught up with me. My body is racked with pain. My bones ache. I am in great pain. I am overcome with shame. I have reproached God's name. I am a fool. I am a hypocrite. From morning to evening, I am oppressed. I rightfully deserve judgment because of my foolish decisions. These were the words of a well-known, famous minister. That minister was King David. And you can read about his lament in Psalms 32, Psalms 38, Psalms 51. But the fact, the truth of the matter is that there is a silent battle that takes place in the heart of every believer. And that's why I ask you this morning to be raw, be honest, and be open. Because I know there's a war within me. It's an invisible battle that nobody around can see. At times, it is suppressed. At other times, it rages like a forest fire. It is the war within. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, or is it just Pastor David? Okay. So we're looking at uh, James chapter 4, and I believe that's where the, the author is going, where God, the Holy Spirit, is inspiring the scriptures. Is verses 1 through 4 is, again, the war within and then verses um, 5 through 17 is about the grace that is greater. But here's the deal. That grace doesn't come automatically. Okay, we're going to see that in the scripture. You have to position yourself. You have to have the right heart. You have to have the right mind as James lays out for us in verses 5 through 17. But when we get there, we'll talk about it. So let's dive into it, family. James chapter 4, verse 1 says this. For what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? So James opens up chapter 4, verse 1, with two questions. With two questions. And the first one is just like a primer. It's like just to get them thinking. Like, you know, he says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? So he gets his audience thinking. And then the second half of verse 1, he goes straight for the heart with his second question to say, no, it's not the people around you. It's the heart within you. It's not the source of pleasures that wage war against your members. This, where does desire, where does the desire for sin come from? As Christians, we like to play the blame game. We like to blame everybody around us except ourselves. And James here in, in chapter 4, verse 1, he is correcting their understanding and our understanding. The desire for sin comes from our flesh. It comes from that thing within. See, when you become a born-again Christian, you're brought to life, you're given this new life, but you're still carrying around this old man. This old man will not be completely eradicated till you get your new body in heaven. So there's this constant battle between the spirit and the flesh. Look at verse 2. He says, he goes on. He says, you lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. What's he describing there? He's describing the war within. If you count him up in verse 2, six times, he says, you, 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 six times. He's talking to the believers. You know, one of the things I love about Scripture is I, I love the, all the doctrines of the New Testament. They're cohesive. In other words, they all blend in together. They, none, no Scripture contradicts another Scripture. They all work together. And in Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about this exact same thing that James talks about where he says in Romans 7, verses 20 through 23, Paul describes the war within him, the apostle Paul. He says, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, Paul's saying, I see this other law working inside of me. And this other law, according to verse 23 of Romans chapter 7, is warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Family, friends, if Paul struggled with the flesh, guess what? So are we. 
so are we. We're looking up at the same blue sky that they looked up way back then. The same battle is within us. And, and we, we, you know, one minute we're praising the Lord, giving glory and honor to God. And the next day in a moment of, of lapse of judgment, we're lusting and murdering and fighting and quarreling and, and living in envy. That, and that's how it is. That's that war. He says in verse 3, he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You know, this war within us, it tempts us. It, it tempts us to focus on our carnal nature. But according to Galatians 2.20, we are called to crucify the old man. We are called to put him to death. And, and we're, we're called to let him, let him go. But that's the constant struggle in the Christian life is letting go of the past and crucifying the flesh and putting it behind us. That is the war that we face. I've been a believer now since 92. I didn't count up. That's 20-something plus years. And I still face battles in my Christian life. You know, that, that, that's part of the, before I was a Christian, there was no battle. I just lived in sin and I enjoyed it. It wasn't until I saw God's law presented to me that I understood that I was a sinner and that I needed a savior. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, I want to live to please the Lord. And now the battle begins. Now, after I became a believer, the, the battle began. But it's that fight. But we got to be raw. We got to be honest. We got to see ourselves in truth. And that's where he's going in verse four. Look at verse four. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Verse 4 is telling us how God views us when we compromise and we love sin more than we love Jesus. And what is it? Spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. You know, Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is the bride, and we are, in a sense, married to the church. The body of Christ is married to Christ. And he longs to have us completely committed to him. And he says there in verse 4, if you notice, very, very strong words. He says, Friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Now, what's he talking about the world there? He's not talking about living on earth and going fishing and enjoying your family and, and living life. When he uses this phrase, friendship with the world, that phrase world in that verse, he's talking about the sin, the evil. He's talking about darkness. And we need to understand that God plays no part in the sin of the world. It's not his plan. His only plan when it comes to sin is to forgive people and to bring them out of it. God does not bless sin. God does not approve of sin. And when a Christian, when a believer, I'm not talking about struggling. I'm not talking about in the fight. But I'm talking about when a, when a Christian lives in willful, continuous rebellion, he or she is working against God. Because God hates sin. Now, we understand as Christians, we struggle with sin. We fight with it. We battle with it. And that's why we have grace. That's why we have grace. Grace enables us to fight the battle and come to a place of victory. That's why God gives us uh, brothers and sisters to hold us accountable and to encourage us. Encourage us. That's why God has given you the church so you can come and grow in the word and be built up. But despite all those things throughout the Christian life, there is a real temptation. There is a real war. Some of you this morning, when the sound of my voice, you are facing this war right now. And I'm here to stand before you and say, I am here to minister to you. I'm here to minister grace to you. I'm here to minister truth to you. I'm here to minister deliverance for you. I'm here to help show you a pathway out. And there's some people in here, you think you're beyond temptation. I'm here to warn you, take heed lest you fall. 
There's a real battle. Continuing in verse 5, James chapter 4, verse 5, he says there, Or do you not think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. This is uh, this verse in, in James 4, 5. This is the one verse that many commentators uh, agree or, or there's different interpretations of it. And it all comes down to where it says he desires the spirit. Some of your translations, they interpret spirit there. It's a little s. And they, and they believe that's referring to the human spirit. Some of your translations have uh, spirit capitalized and it is referring to the Holy Spirit. I believe in the context of what the, the author is saying in James chapter 4, I believe it's the reference to the Holy Spirit. But basically what it's saying is the Spirit jealously desires our devotion to Christ. And even if you interpret it the other way, you're just saying God desperately desires for you to give him his, your heart that he put within you when you were formed. So either way, either way, it's a jealous devotion. It's a jealousy, excuse me, it's a jealousy for your devotion to Jesus. It's what the Spirit wants in your life. The Spirit desires, the Holy Spirit de desires that you leave the sinful world behind, that you place Christ first in everything, and that you be completely sold out to Christ. If you've been born again, if you've ever, you know, we live in this physical body. Now, I'm not talking about inside the cavity of your chest, next to your heart and your organs, but inside you, there is a spiritual man. There is a spiritual woman that's inside you, okay? And when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside that spiritual being of who you are. And he has a will. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And his, one of his purpose is to draw you to complete devotion to Christ. The Holy Spirit does not want to be part of your life. He wants to be your life. He wants to be your life. So there you have, well, actually, I, I went into verse 5. Verses 1 through 4 uh, addresses the war that's within. Verse 5 addresses the Spirit's desire for our complete devotion to Christ. And verse 6 tells us what we need. It tells us what we need, and it tells, uh, tells us why Pastor David chose to be a Calvary Chapel pastor. What led me to say, you know what, I want to be a part of the Calvary Chapel movement. And is why? It's because of their emphasis on grace. Because you and I, we cannot do it on our own. More than anything, we need grace. We need grace for devotion to Christ. We need grace for deliverance from sin. We need grace towards each other. You know, human beings, sometimes we don't always see eye to eye. Sometimes we're in joyous fellowship. Sometimes we're in conflict. But that's where grace comes in. We need grace. And grace will take us out of this war within. We have to open our hearts to grace. Look at the opening of verse 6. Verse 6 is where I got the second half of my, the title of my message, A Grace That Is Greater. He opens up at verse 6 with a change of thought, and he says, but he gives a greater grace. This is what we need to win the war, is this greater grace. This is above and beyond saving grace. This is uh, God's power, God's presence. It causes you to grow. It, ca it causes you uh, to grow in sanctification. This is the kind of grace that we need this is the kind of grace that we need in those moments of the battle, those moments when we're fighting and we're warring with our flesh. We have to stop in the moment and say, Lord, I need you. Grace, change my heart. Do you want it this morning? If you want it, please listen closely. Because I believe, as, as James is going to lay out here in these next verses, this greater grace is introduced at the opening of verse 6. There's things that we got to do to partake of it. Let's take a look at them. Verse 6, after he says, but he gives a greater grace, he, 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 he lays out some qualifications. He lays out some stipulations. He lays out what, 
where your heart and your mind have to be in order to partake of this greater grace. He says in verse 6, Therefore it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. To, uh, to be prideful means to be arrogant, to be full of yourself. And look, and look at what it says. These are very strong words. It says, God is opposed to the proud. In other words, God will work against you. If you, if you are proud, if you're pride-filled, if you're arrogant, if you're full of yourself, if you think, well, I don't need God no more. But if you're humble, if you're humble, uh, meaning you let God know, Lord, I can't do this by myself. As that song we closed, that we closed with before I preached, I, I can't do it without you meeting me here. I can't do it without you invading my heart. I can't do it without um, a, a complete surrender to to humble ourselves means that we surrender to Christ we obey him and we place him first and when you do that in the context of what's being said through all of verse 6 how he opens it up with a greater grace I believe a greater measure of grace comes our way now what is grace we all know that famous phrase grace is God's unmerited favor but it's but it's much more than that it is his unmerited favor but it's his blessing on your life. It's him changing your heart. It's him giving you victory. And as we're going to see in three or four verses down, it's, it's where he lifts you up. He lifts you up. You, the situation you find yourself in, in your carnality, in your flesh, you repent. And what he does is he picks you up and he places you in the palm of his hand and he lifts you up. That's what grace does. That's what grace does. And that's what we need That's what we need in our war within. He continues in verse 7. He says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You want a greater measure of grace? Just do what the scripture says there. First he says, submit to the Lord. What what does that phrase, submit to the Lord, mean? It simply means you follow his word. You, you, You follow his word. You yield to the Holy Spirit, and you let his lordship be displayed in the way you live your life. You know, we as Christians confess Jesus as Lord of our lives. When you say Jesus is Lord, you're saying, Jesus, you have all, you're the sovereign Lord of the universe, but you have all dominion over my life. And when you understand that lordship aspect of who Jesus is, as a, as a good soldier of, of, or a good, good soldier of Christ or Christian, you will submit to his lordship. And then he says there to resist the devil. To, to, that word resist, the devil, it speaks of action. It means we fight. We fight and we run from temptation. And we don't go places where you know you will be tempted. We, we fight like crazy. I remember as a young Christian traveling with the military, I was on fire for the Lord. I was praising the Lord on Sunday. In the Bible studies, traveling with the military, they put us up in a hotel. I go into a hotel room. I'm tired. I'm worn out. And uh, I have my Bible laid aside. I cut the TV on. And as soon as I cut the TV on, without turning any channels, this picture came up. And it was, it, it was um, a man and woman. And they were heading towards the bedroom. And it was, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't stay there long enough to figure out what it was. But I could tell it wasn't a good place. And I immediately... I kid you not, I immediately turned the channel. I said, I'm not watching that garbage. And as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, there's this desire within me to turn the channel back. My flesh was wanting to gratify itself. And in the moment, there's this war. And I was like, whoa, this is a serious war. I took that remote control. I threw it across the room, and I got my Bible out, and I said, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to give in, and I'm going to throw that remote control on the other side of the room, and I'm going to read my Bible. Uh, Yeah, praise God. Praise the Lord. But there's a real fight. And sometimes, now listen, sometimes we lose battles, and sometimes we win battles. I'm not this holier-than-thou person, but I learned how to win that fight. I woke up the next morning, opened my eyes, on my pillow, and there was my Bible in there. And I said, praise the Lord, glory to God. I won that battle. 
But that's a real battle that we all face. But we resist the devil. You know, we fight, we run from temptations, and we don't go places where we will be tempted. Don't put yourself in that situation. Then he says there in, uh, yeah, we're at verse 8. I had to lose my, I lost my spot there for a minute. Talking about a greater grace. You know, these are, again, I want you to notice, you know, you could go through here and you could circle the action words. These are action words that are, that are required by the believer, okay? It's just loaded with application and words that, that we have to do, that we have to take action on to partake of this greater grace. And the next one in verse 8, look at it. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Wow. I remember when I first got saved, this is one of the first verses I read in the Bible, and in my coffin rack in the Navy, um, I, I, I wrote this every single night in my coffin rack. It's the place you sleep. It's, it's the size of a coffin. And I wrote this verse, and it was one of my favorite verses as a Christian. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. What an amazing promise, Christian that you have from scripture that if you will draw nigh to him he will come down and draw close to you that phrase draw near it means that we come close now you say well pastor how do i how do i draw closer to the lord what's that what does that look like you know i can't go up in the air i can't go towards the sky what does it mean to draw close Three words, prayer, getting in your prayer closet, closing your eyes, bowing your head, and crying out to the Lord, pouring your heart out to him, praying to him, sharing with him what's on your heart, giving him thanks, giving him praise. Those are the things that the Father sees, and as you draw close to him, he draws closest to you. Worship, singing songs, making music in your heart to the Lord. You know, I, I, I'm not sure if it's written in the Bible or not, but I've heard it quoted a lot. But praise looks good on you. Do you know that? Praise looks good on his children. When God looks down and sees his children praising and worshiping his name, he draws close. Studying the Bible, what we're doing right now, what we're looking into the word. See, when we open the Bible, God is speaking to us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is inspired by God. If you need a word from the Lord, open up your Bible and, and read it and understand, according to uh, Hebrews 4.12, that it's living and active and it is the Lord uh, speaking to you. When you do all these things, I believe you experience a greater measure of grace. That, that, that as you are drawing close to the Lord in life, he is drawing closer to you you. You know, one of the, the uh, one of my greatest helps in preparing a sermon every single, every week is, uh, my wife will tell you, I go in my study, I, I get out my Bibles, I get out my, you know, um, commentaries, I fire up the computer, I get my Word document going, and, but the, the greatest thing above commentaries or Bible logos or the, even my Bibles laying out to my side is that I, before I prepare a sermon, I spend time in prayer. And I spend some time with the worship music playing. Spend time praying, Lord, I just ask you to give me these words. Give me this outline. Help me put this together. You know, spend time in prayer. And then praise and worship, you know. Stir my heart. Stir my emotions. Lord, take me in to this passage. Let me feel what James is feeling. Let me see what the, the, what the uh, recipients of the letter were going through. <clears throat> it's all these things that help me prepare a sermon is first drawing near to the Lord. Then he continues in verse 8. Let's look at the next part of it. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. One of the essential elements of experiencing grace is this. You and I need to understand completely that God is holy. That God is holy. 
God is holy. He's pure. He's perfect. He's, he's, he's without sin. He's, he's without sin. When Jesus died on the cross, the Father poured out on Jesus his wrath for the sin of the world. And God calls, calls us, you and I today as Christians, to repent. To repent. Repent means to turn away from sin. To renounce the old life, the old life, the old lifestyle. Verse 9, he says, let your laughter be turned into mourning. Before I was a believer, sin, <laughs> love it. I was, I was digging it. I was, I was living in laughter in my sinful darkness. But when God opened my heart, that laughter and that joy of living in darkness turned into mourning. It turned into mourning. And I wept over my sin. I understood that the deeds of darkness weren't bringing me joy, but they were bringing me separation from the Lord. And then when I understood the cross, that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my forgiveness, uh, I was like, sin, even though I struggle with it and I fight with it at times, I hate it. And I had, I had a newfound passion to run from it and to flee from it because sin brings destruction. But God causes, he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, he's saying to experience a greater measure of grace, we've got to come to a place of repentance. And even after you become a Christian, years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years later, there, there, will, there will come times where God will bring things to your heart, he'll bring things to your mind, and he'll say, hey, you need to repent. Bring it to my throne of grace. Acts says, repent, that therefore times of refreshing may come. Times of refreshing, times of renewal. That's that greater grace that the scripture talks about. Then he says in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. Now we talked about, he's closing out here of these positional places that you need to be in. In verse 6, we talked about walk, being humble. But here, James mentions it again. He says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. And what does it say? Here's that greater grace. He will what? Lift you up. He will lift you up. To be humble means to get low. It means to get on your face. And then when you look at all those things we just talked about, you know, submitting to the Lord, drawing near, repenting, what is verse 10? What is the promise of verse 10? Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will what? He will exalt you. He will lift you up. He will lift you out of the miry clay and he'll put you in the hand of grace. And that grace will take you from a place of sin to a place of forgiveness, to a place of freedom. The promise is he will lift you up. You know, there's, it's in Corinthians. I don't know the exact address, but he will, um, he'll make you a trophy of grace. He'll make you a trophy of grace. He, he will make you a trophy for the world to see. This is what I can do with a sinner who puts their trust in me. I will make them a trophy of grace. I will make them a showcase for the world to see. This is what God will do when you um, put your trust in Christ. God's saying to people, this is what I can do when people put their trust in me, bringing you complete freedom and liberty, and lifting you up. Now, let's look at verses 11 through 17. 11 through 17, there's a slight, there's a, a, a slight shift. There's a slight shift in the thought of James chapter 4. And if I, if I, if I gave this section uh, a theme or a title, I would say this. This greater grace that we've talked about, it impacts everything. It impacts not only what's in your heart, but it impacts everything the way you live, and on the outside. Let's take a look at it. Verse 11 and 12, he says, Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, and the one who is able to save and to destroy. 
but who are you who judge your neighbors? If you notice in verse 11, he uses the phrase brethren, brother, and brother. What does this speak of? What does this verse speak of? It speaks of family relations within the body of Christ. You could apply it to your family too, but, but he's, he's speaking to Christians, to these Jewish believers. He's speaking to this local church, and he's talking about the family relationship dynamics within their body. So we could talk about the family dynamics or the relationships within the body here. And so how are we to treat one another <laughs> How are we to treat one another? How are we to talk to one another? How are we to care for one another? Is it important? And the answer is yes. Part of your Christian walk, part of you serving the Lord, includes not just your heart devotion and your surrender and your commitment to Jesus, but it also includes how we treat each other. Number one, we are called to love each other. We are called to love each other. There needs to be a deep, fervent love between all of us. People outside the church also, you know, our neighbors, our friends, and everyone in this world, we love them. But there needs to be a special, divine, holy love within the body of Christ. We're called to support each other. We're called to support each other. We're called to come alongside, you know, if... If we see something going on with the Hepkins, we need to come alongside and help them. If you see something going on with the Fords, and you know, hopefully people will come alongside and help us. But we're called to support and help each other get through life. We're called to protect each other. We're called to protect each other, to protect our names, to defend one another. There needs to be this strong, impenetrable bond within the body of Christ. Do we have that? Are we moving in that right direction? I know I'm the pastor and I like to say a lot of good things, but I think for the most part, Calvary Chapel Irmo is. We, we, we have a strong body here of people that love one another, that support one another. Uh, I hear about phone calls and emails and people checking on one another, and I, th I think it's pretty strong here. I think it's pretty strong here. And also, he talks about uh, don't judge, you know, don't judge. Don't be the ultimate authority over another believer's life and their relationship with Christ. When a brother or sister within the body sins, don't drop the gavel. Don't drop the gavel. Point them to Jesus because he's the ultimate judge. I'm not the judge. Blake's not the judge. Andy's not the judge. Jesus is the judge. I think this is where people get that phrase, judge not lest you be judged. I'm not sure about that. But, but the point is, uh, we point people to the ultimate judge, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we don't drop the gavel. Judgment belongs to the Lord. Our, now, it doesn't mean we don't call out sin or we, or we don't hold someone accountable. You know, we, we need to exercise church discipline. But everything needs to be done in a spirit of grace in a spirit of truth, in a spirit of reconciliation and restoration. You know, our ultimate goal is to point you to the Savior and let the Holy Spirit do his work. Verse 13 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Here, James is talking about the brevity of life. He, he's, he's talking about the brevity of life. And, you know, we don't like to talk about passing away and, and we don't like to talk about death. But it's, it's part of the ultimate statistic. And nobody's ever dodged it. Ten out of ten people die. You know, a hundred years from now, Roughly 100 years from now, everybody that is alive on planet Earth today will have passed away. And he says there um, in verse 14, he says, you are just a vapor. We're just a vapor. <laughs> we're, just a, a, we're just a vapor. We're, we're here for a little while, and then we're gone. He says, 
You're just a vapor that appears for a little while. That phrase in verse 14, a little while. That little while is a reference to our life. To, to our life here on earth. You know, we need to live with an eternal perspective. Whether you're five years old or a hundred years old, no one is promised tomorrow. And we need to, we, I, I plan my life, I live as though Jesus is coming tomorrow, but I plan it as though, I don't know, the Lord's going to give me a hundred years. But, and then it says, and then it vanishes away. It, it vanishes away. You know, last Sunday, uh, I went to the early morning service at Calvary Chapel Stone Mountain at 8.15 and got out of there at 9.30 and I was listening to Calvary Chapel Irmo coming down I-20, man. Awesome service last week, man. Pastor Steve rocked it and the worship team was great. But I stopped in Augusta for lunch and I stopped at a little restaurant and it just so happens that this, this um, restaurant that I stopped for lunch was just a mile and a half away from my grandparents' grave. And I had to stop by there just to, just to reflect, you know, I understand that it's just their bodies and they've gone home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was just a, it was like a, oh, I don't like it. Because this is my grandma and grandpa that I loved. And my cousin Billy over here. And, and it's like, there was this part of me that just was like, I hate death. I hate what death does because it rips apart those, it takes those that we love and they're no longer with us. But then, in my moment of like, man, I miss grandma and grandpa. And just thinking about them, I was like, but they're in heaven. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, there, there was this hope. So I, I didn't mourn as the world mourns and that they passed away. Because I will see them again. But sometimes we need to be reminded of the brevity of life and give our whole lives to serving Christ, knowing that only what's done for eternity will last. You know, we need to love our families, love, love our husbands, love your wives, wives, love your husbands greatly, love your children, love your church, be thankful for all the Lord has given you and just saturate everyone with the love of Christ. Amen? So let's live with an eternal perspective. Let's, let's understand that truth. Um, and, 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 be, and, and be mindful of pride, you know. In, in verse 13 says, Today or tomorrow we will go to such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. The idea is that this person has no thought of God, no thought of eternity. And that's the greatest mistake in this world is to go through this life with no thought of eternity. But verse 15 Verse 15 gives us insight on how we should talk about the future. Verse 15 says, Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live also. We, we will live and also do this or do that. Every future plan, and this is where everybody gets the phrase, Lord willing, <laughs> but every future plan that we have for our family, for our church, for ministry, for future plans, should be prefaced with Lord willing. Lord willing. And that's really, I, I look at that as a, as a statement of faith too. You're saying, what you're basically saying is, this is what, this is what I want to do. These are the plans I have. But Lord, if it be your will. You know, you, it's a statement of faith saying that whatever you're looking forward to do, Lord, I'm going to trust you no matter what. And if this is indeed of you, you will bring it to pass. And if it's not of you, you, you will bring it to an end. But to say of all of our plans, Lord willing, we will move forward. Lord willing, we will do this. Lord willing, we'll have more children. Lord willing, our church will expand. Lord willing, we'll launch this ministry or launch that ministry. Lord willing, you'll get this job or get this job or move to the city or do this city. Very important. That, that we surrender our future plans to the Lord. Verses 16 and 17. But as it is, um, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Again, he's, he's talking about pride there. You, you boast in your arrogance. 
you know, a, a, a big mouth, a big heart with no thoughts of God. And, and all such boasting is evil. Even our thoughts, our plans, our actions in life, we need to look to the Lord to fulfill those plans, to put them in motion or to bring them to an end. And, and, but we shouldn't be boastful. We shouldn't be arrogant. You know, we should be careful with our voices to give all the glory and honor to God. You know, and that's not being religious. That's just being real. That's just saying, Lord, I want you to be honored. I want you to be glorified. I don't want to boast in myself. There's nothing worth boasting about me. But let, let us boast in Christ and celebrate and rejoice when God takes us to those places. Then he closes the chapter, verse 17, our final verse. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. You have the, the, the sins of omission. You know, it's important in life as we live out our Christian faith that when we see the right thing and we know the right thing to do, we need to do it. We need to do it. We need to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we see a need, we need to, to, to help one another, to encourage one another. And sometimes, you know, we, we get things wrong. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, I may say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And as a pastor, I need to make sure I can come back and say, hey, guys, I'm sorry. I, I, I messed up. But, but we need to have that kind of open heart in our walk with the Lord. Man, you want to you wanna break down a conflict within a, a husband and wife marriage relationship? If, you, if you're in a conflict and you, and you want to dissolve it, man, go to your spouse and say, honey, I blew it. I'm sorry. It just melts the defense, and it brings the two back together. And sometimes, you know, it might be a mixture. It might be some of his fault, some of her fault. But, but if you'll just do the right thing, and say, honey, I'm sorry for my part I played. I'm, I'm sorry for my... It will melt the defense, and, and it'll, it'll bring the two together. We need to understand that on those areas outside the Scripture that the Scripture doesn't specifically address, that we always do our very best with a good conscience to do the right thing. Amen? Amen. I hope you've been blessed by James chapter 4. We learned from this chapter. What did we learn from this chapter? That there, in verses 1 through 5, that there is a war. There's a war within your heart. There's a war within us, you know, with the spirit versus the flesh. But in the same chapter, we start in verse 5, that, that there's a, the Holy Spirit who yearns for our devotion to Christ. And in verse 6 on, there is a greater grace. There is a grace that will, um, a grace that is greater than our temptation. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you, Lord, for James chapter 4. And Father, as, as we've looked at the war within, Father, as, as I encouraged everyone before, help us to be honest. Help us to be honest before you and, and confess our weakness. Confess the struggle. Confess the war. And then, Lord, help us to put your word into practice by doing what it says, by drawing near, Father God, by submitting to you, by resisting the devil, by walking in humility. Lord, help us to apply these truths to our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.